Hi, welcome to the Orlando Sentinels editorial board interview featuring Orlando City Council seat um, four, which takes in a large part of the downtown area, including East by Four, Colonial Town, Thornton Park, Eola Heights, the Milk District, and oddly enough, the Mall at Millennia. Um, the incumbent is Patty Sheehan, who was first elected in 2000. Her challengers are conservative talk show host Randy Ross and um, Katie Koch, who is an executive with IFCO Systems here in Orlando. Thank you so much all for being here with us today. And we're going to start with questions. Um, and well, let's just go right to the recent news. Um, what is your take on the changes that the mayor outlined earlier this week to the downtown redevelopment plan, since District 4 is right in the heart of downtown? And let's start with Ms. Cox. Thank you, Chris. And again, thank you for having me on here. Um, it was uh, an honor and a privilege to be part of the state of downtown yesterday. So I was able to hear um, Mayor Dyer's outline of the vision for the city, which um, the vision is is great. Um, I, I think it's great that we're bringing you know more more retail, um, more development into downtown. My concern in being in that in that meeting and hearing these things is that we're still not addressing some of the core issues that are going on in District Four. So we want to bring in businesses, we want to bring in retail, we want to bring in um, kind of nightlife and things like that. But there's no talk about prioritizing um, the fact that crime is is very high in District 4, um, that there's an issue with safety. So um, I think the vision is great. I think there's a lot of wonderful people that work in the city that are developing this, but I have a lot of concerns that we're not addressing some of the core issues that are going on in District 4, specifically downtown around safety. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Ross to respond next, please. Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate the opportunity and ladies. Um, I had a different take on yesterday. First of all, I was impressed that the mayor started out with public safety. This is the number one point uh, when discussing everyone's neighborhood. Uh, I've lived in downtown since 2003, and I've lived in Orlando since 1993. I see a very different Orlando than when I first came to to realize. I, I see a, a, a city that red brick street maintenance is not there. Um, I can walk by the same spot every day with my dog now for two or three years since COVID and see that there's trees popping red brick streets up. Um, I feel like um, I support the bar and restaurant owners on Wall Street and in downtown. I'm totally against the referendum that is keeping them from being able to be open. And I didn't appreciate that the mayor decided to suggest that the bar owners have some responsibility to outside of their own safety within their facilities to hire off-duty policemen in order to subsidize um, uh, the safety and security of those that come downtown. So while I thought it was nice, I thought it was a nice hurrah, and I do, I don't have any ill will towards the mayor or the council for that matter. I do believe it's time for some drastic change in order to address the issues that are there. Thank you, and Commissioner Sheehan. Oh, yes, I too was at the State of Downtown yesterday, and I um, share Mayor Dyer's vision that we do need to keep downtown safer. Um, we do have 25 officers assigned to downtown detail already, and we are, we're already having a, we were having a problem with safety in our downtown shootings and things like that. I think the bar owners should pay a fa their fair share of the um, of the cost of providing the extra security. We have gone from having about eight bars in downtown in the 1980s. Now, you know, years later, we have almost 100. So it's a, there's a lot of bars. And unfortunately, the nighttime activity has created a situation where it's unsafe between midnight and 2 o'clock a.m. What's open? The bars. So I do think it's the responsibility of the bar owners to help us take care of the situation um, since we have required them to put magnetometers in to actually be responsible and make sure that they're maintaining their occupancy, which has caused problems. Um, and also to, to, uh, to contribute to off-duty, the, the crime has gone down significantly. 
Um, I think we have a lot of challenges in downtown. I have Rosalind east of downtown, so I don't have a lot of the bars that are actually in my district. I have more of the Thornton Park area, but I think we all need to um, be wary of, of the security and safety in downtown. And I also like the fact that the mayor was talking about adapting to changing office space since so many workers are working virtually. We're going to have to look to retail and other opportunities in order to diversify our downtown. One of the follow-ups specific, specifically in District 4 is that um, as entertainment has grown downtown, housing costs have skyrocketed and District 4 is hit particularly hard with by this. What, if anything, should the city be doing in addition to its current efforts to expand affordable housing? And let's start with Mr. Ross. You know, this has been an issue almost long, it's much longer than what it's been in the news in downtown. When I first came downtown in 2002, um, that same house that I bought for 268,000 is right now on the market for $749,000. I couldn't afford that, by the way. Um, and I look at that situation and I realize that unless we put in the things that people don't want to talk about, more apartment communities that have, have actually appeal. And I saw the mayor's speech yesterday and he spoke to the affordable housing that's going in, but in district four, we don't have the same luxury that I'm seeing in Lake Ivanhoe area, or that we're seeing in Commissioner Hills district over in district five, because in order to do that, we'd have to tear down some of our, our beautiful homes that are historic homes in our area. So we, in district four specifically, don't have the same opportunities that some of the other areas do have. And that is a, that in and of itself is an inherent problem. I don't think we're ever going to see all the homes torn down around Lake Davis, or Lake Cherokee, and high rises put in their place. So what we have to be able to recognize is that if we're going to be pushing people a little out of District 4, which is just the reality, we do not have the land space in the district to be able to build affordable housing. It's going to have to go into spaces and places like the Lake Nona area and like the, what they're doing over in Lake Ivanhoe and other sectors, especially over in District 5. I mean, the, I think they've done some amazing th things over there to bring more affordable housing forward. And we have to look at those examples and start encouraging the folks to move into those areas as well. So again, when you look at District 4 specifically, we are a residential community. And as a result, the residential property prices in this district are quite high. Thank you. We have Foss from the dais at City Hall about the rating of Sadowski Fund for years, and I'm, fr I'm so frustrated that now $4 billion later, that money has been reallocated to state government instead of building affordable housing, and that money would have gone to the major cities, Orlando, Jacksonville, Miami, and Tampa. And it's just ridiculous that the state has raided the Sadowski Fund. I wish the realtors would would be more strong in their in their fight to get that money back because it's their dot stamps, and we should be using that to build affordable housing. But we do have the ability to build affordable housing. The city of Orlando has taken $53 million from the, um, from the American Rescue Plan. We were able to, to kind of move some, some funding around and we're gonna be doing some affordable housing projects. We do have a bit, we do have a, available housing opportunities along division. When we, um, when we did the division plan, there is going to be some housing coming into that area, which is now industrial because that area has kind of changed from um, from more industrial. It's going to be there's opportunities to change to more residential, and we also we have a, um, a we have a project that's coming over there. So I think there are opportunities for affordable housing, and we are going to be building affordable housing, um, and we need to do more in Orlando. But this is a housing crisis that unfortunately has been created by not allowing um, not allowing affordable housing by stopping the rent control ordinance that should have happened in Orange County. And we're trying to do the right thing in progressive cities. It's a crisis and we need to solve it because if we don't, we're gonna have more homelessness. And Ms. Cop, you could, could address that sure. as well. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, Orlando uh, is specifically District 4 already has a, a pretty thin supply of a, affordable housing as it is. I don't think this is new information that um, affordable housing uh, needed, to, needed to be built, you know, years ago because, um, you know, the contracts for this rental assistance that that these folks have and that these folks need is about is about to expire. So the fact that we're not proactively um, addressing this well before we you can't be in reactive mode. You have to be in proactive mode, right? So we know it's coming. Um, I specifically I. I mean, downtown in, in, you know, my kids go to Blinker and Boone. 
uh, there are families on a regular basis losing their home. You know, the median income in Orlando is, is $39,000. And we know what the rent looks like. We know what the housing market looks like. And these folks are working full time and they can't afford to rent an apartment. And, and it's very sad. So it's very disappointing that, you know, proactively we, we haven't been ahead of this. Um, but, you know, going forward, you know, I think there needs to be better communication. There needs to be conversations with communities that have gotten out ahead of this. Uh, I think it's important to not work in a silo and work with the organizations and the, and the people in this community that can help solve this problem. Thank you. Are you comfortable with the relationship between OUC and the, the utility and um, the city as it stands? And let's start with um, the commissioner. Sure, yeah, I think our relationship with OUC is, is great. It's a city owned utility, but they have their own board. So we don't have direct control over it. The mayor serves on the OUC board. But, you know, but a municipal utility, it's really helped to add millions of dollars. OUC does do a direct transfer to the city of Orlando. It helps keep our taxes down for our citizens. So I think it's a good relationship. The only concern I've really had with OUC, um, and, and they do a great job, by the way, with emergency response, with restoring power, doing a great job with communication. So a good relationship there. I have had a problem with them, however, um, with some of our... Um, sustainability solar initiatives um ouc was actually trying to work with some of the uh some of the, po the power companies to do away with net metering i think that if people put solar energy put solar panels on their house they should be completely compensated for that investment you know fair just to let it out there i i, I do have solar panels but uh, i think that if people are going to make that investment they're helping out the utility they're actually creating their own power they should be fairly compensated for that and municipal and utilities all over across America are trying to uh, to stop that, and I think that's wrong. I think it's only fair if people make the investment; they should be able to to get their return on investment for solar power and solar solar energy. Um, Mr. Roth, back of yesterday, I, I know Katie doesn't live very far from me. We had a power outage in downtown Orlando before the storm came through. Um, and I was on one of the community pages and uh, the lady had suggested it was a substation and it wouldn't be back up until late and it was back up in 15 minutes. My only concern with our relationship with any utility, specifically with OUC, is I have watched our utility bill. Um, yeah, as everyone knows, I, I care for my mom. So it's like I, I work from home. I'm here. I, I, I monitor all of that. And I cannot believe the increases in pricing that we have seen with that utility, even within the last year um you know we're it's a unique situation and that as a result of that watching that i see it with just two people i cannot imagine a family of four a family of five uh people with multiple generational families living in their situation how they're able to afford not just that increase of course what we're seeing at the grocery store and such so i'd like to see a little bit more effort being placed on being reminded our role on the city council in my opinion because we don't we don't really deal with schools and we don't really deal with some of the the bigger issues at the state level but we certainly can talk about what happens on the local level and when it comes to impacting families impacting individuals impacting seniors i think we need to take a closer look at that and um based on what the the commissioner is referencing to if the mayor is on there i wish he was fighting a little bit more for the average citizen you know today the mcmansions are coming in they take a four hundred thousand dollar house and they build a million dollar home in their place so the, the landscape of our entire community is changing and i i would like to see more effort being placed on trying to minimize those costs if at all possible thank you um Ms. Koch? thank you so um definitely want to echo randy's Randy's comments that OEC does a great job on responsiveness and getting power back up. And certainly as, as a mom and, and a business owner in District 4, uh, we see the increase in costs in, uh, in our, our utility bills as well. Um, I will say as, as someone that's not a politician, uh, but a resident of District 4 for 18 years, I don't fully understand the relationship between OUC and our city. I have to be very honest. I go to all of our community meetings, um, I follow the news. I do everything I can to get information. But 
there's definitely a, a, just a lack of communication. So when you ask that question, I can honestly say, I don't know how the city and OUC interact together. I can only tell you as a resident and a business owner that, um, you know, it, you know, it's disappointing to not understand the relationship better, but definitely appreciate and trust um, the leadership and, and, and the support that OUC gives our community. Thank you. Okay. Uh, please tell the voters, what are the two specific initiatives that you would like to see accomplished in your term um, that is different than maybe what the city is planning to do? What, what, what would you be spending your time on and, and leading on, starting with uh, Commissioner Shan, and then going to uh, Ms. Co Co Koch, and then uh, Randy Ross? Okay. Yeah, I think what we really need desperately in Orlando is an affordable housing ordinance. Uh, we were actually preempted from the from state government from doing any kind of a rent control, which would have helped provide, um, you know, rent relief to to residents in our in our in District Four. Very frustrating. But if we can get an affordable housing ordinance, what the state has allowed us to do and when, when not preempted us to do is if we allow a density bonus on apartments, we can require affordable housing as part of that. The problem is that we have no way to inspect and make sure those affordable units are affordable, that they you know, fall within the AMI, all these things that, that, that we need to make sure happens are, are based on 30% of income. However, we're going to define the affordable housing. That all has to be codified in affordable housing ordinance. I've been trying to get that done for the last year. Um, I think it's important for us to get an affordable housing ordinance. My colleagues have been great about saying, okay, well, we've got so many units. Let's get, let's get some affordable, but we don't have any way to enforcement. So we need an affordable housing ordinance with teeth. And I think that we also need to to uh, work you know, cl more closely with communities about crime. My district is the only one that does crime stats every single month. It's posted on my website. People know what's going on in their neighborhoods and we do have the lowest crime in the city. Thank you, Ms. Koch. So uh, first off, it, number one for me is, um, is crime. So Orlando unfortunately has this kind of dubious distinction of being number two of the most dangerous cities in the entire state of Florida. So I think it's imperative when, um, you know, the next per person takes office, is, there's meetings happening with the chief of police and we need to identify within district four, um, where, where, where are the areas of concern? What are we doing to prevent crime? So you can have crime stats and that's fine. So that's, that's great, but what are we doing to prevent it, right? Are we, are we cranking up neighborhood watch programs? Are we properly funding our police department? Are we filling the vacancies? There's a lot of vacancies within the police department. Um, so that's, for me, that's number one. And then the other would be term limits. You know, it's it's incredibly important to have fresh new voices and perspective um, to bring growth to our city. Uh, we all live in this city because we love it. We've Everybody on this call has lived here for a significant amount of time, but without change and without new fresh new voices, um, it's, it's really hard. You don't, you don't, you want to stay in, we don't want to stay in the status quo. We want to grow. So I think it's important to, to make sure that people who live in this community, we have amazing, wonderful, smart people that want to contribute and they want to serve to encourage that and put those term limits into place. Thank you. So of course you only want two, and I, I got my head up multiple ones. Uh, you know, Uniquely, and these aren't my points, in 2015, when I ran for this race, I was knocking on doors and I thought I knew what people wanted. I thought this the property tax increase was going to be a big deal. I thought doing a dog park for six and a half million dollars is going to be a big deal. And I was totally off base. What was a big deal to people? Um, now at the big deal I hear at the door, of course, is community safety. I, there's no secret. It's number one that I hear at the door and people are concerned. I used to walk my dog at three o'clock in the morning around Lake Davis on a rate, my beagles, now I have a golden doodle, but I would walk them because I couldn't sleep or something. I wouldn't, I don't even walk my dog at night anymore in that area. Red brick streets were something I heard in 2015. And I didn't think that, I didn't know how to posture that to say, everybody's upset about the way the streets are being maintained. Because there's a lot of Orlando that doesn't have red brick streets, but I have a, a person that's actually had three blowouts. One of which, by the way, the uh, city paid for. I support Katie and the term limits, but most importantly, as a person that cares for a senior, our community is not just young people moving into apartments. 
There are senior citizens in our community that need guidance and help. I'm on the phone, I can't tell you how often, dealing with insurance issues with my mom, I, all kinds of issues when it comes to her healthcare arranging appointments. Some, some seniors just give up. So I think we need to do a better job communicating with seniors in our community, community and be able to give them hope because usually their fam family has abandoned them. You know, it's not easy to be a caregiver. Thank you all for that. I, I wanted to jump in with a quick question. Another thing that's been in the news a bunch lately is the tourist development tax and whether there are new ways to spend it or, or whether it should be spent in different ways than it is right now. And I wanted to see realistically what, uh, what are the opinions on whether it should be a status quo or how would you see extensions to how the tourist development tax is spent? And I guess we will start with Ms. Cox. PJ, um, you know, as it pertains to, to the tourists, and, and I'm going to speak specifically about District 4, um, you know, I, I'm very concerned around are we fostering an environment that would would bring um, tourism back downtown, right? When we moved here, everybody wanted to come downtown, even if you went to Universal or if you went to Disney, downtown Orlando was kind of this hot spot, and that's where people wanted to go and they wanted to interact. And that's really gone away. So I, I'm concerned that we're still not focusing on the right things that are gonna bring kind of those corporations and that environment back into downtown um, to bring people in. I can tell you as a mom, uh, we don't, uh, of two small kids and a lot of families don't and there's a lot of families in district four we don't seek downtown uh, specifically district four as somewhere where we feel safe in a comfortable environment um, we, we find those places outside of that so again um, I think if we need to focus on some of the core issues to get the businesses down here to bring the people back into downtown thank you Jay thank you Mr. Uh, Mr. Ross the bedhead tax has been something that ever since voters voted on it with the specific issues that it could be used for, it's been this desire to try to, to, to adjust what it should be used for. Here, here's the reality of the situation. Uh, it can't go for some of the things that people wanted to. Today, Mayor, uh, uh, the mayor of Orange County, Jerry Demings, put out a memo to the city council, and it's out there in public format now, where he believes that we should, that we should all support the continued um, improvements to Camping World Stadium. Everybody knows that Camping World Stadium we had a Band-Aid put on it not long ago. And at our expense, we did that because at the time we were still going through the process of, are we gonna have soccer in the Camping World Stadium or are we gonna build a stadium? Eventually, as we know, we built a stadium. So I do not, I believe there's money that we should be seeking to maybe look at the uh, privatization of the creation of the Camping, a new Camping World Stadium, not putting more money after old. We did that with the, Amway Arena, we tore it down, we built a new one. There's a reason we did that because sometimes an antiquated property is better to leave and go on and build something new. So when we talk about, is the bed hack tax being used right? Should it be used for education? Should it be used for things that are outside of what the voters voted on, which is so critical here? We can't change the will of the people. And that is that conversation, the conversation we're having right now is designed to change the will of the people. So my, my two cents on it is if people want that tax to do something else, then they need to take it back to the people and let them vote on it and make a decision on how they want that money to be spent. Thank you, Commissioner Sheehan. Yeah, the tourist development tax is a self tax on the hotel industry. And what frustrates me is that whenever there's a pile of money, someone else wants it. And, you know, same thing with the community redevelopment agency. Those are specific purposes that those are approved for. And while I understand that everybody's got a lot of opinions, there is, there is a reason that the, the tourist tax pays for things like Camping World or the Performing Arts Center or things like that. They're supposed to pay for enhancements. If we want things like better roads and things like that, we should have, we should have passed our own transportation sales tax, which we did not do. I think it's wrong to look to the hotel industry to solve our problems and we're not even willing to sell tax when other counties around us, like Seminole County, they have a one cent sales tax. And by the way, the brick streets would have been repaired with that money. I've got to beg for, for brick street repair money every year. That money would have, would have come through the, um, the one cent sales tax and we did not pass it. So if we're going to complain about our roads and the condition of things, we have to be willing to put aside the funding to be able to pay for that. It's all about the money. So um, I think that the TDT and the CRA are being spent in the appropriate way. If we want to fix some of these other issues, we're gonna to have to look towards other revenues in order to do so. 
Well, um, that was a perfect segue. Thank you, because in many ways, it is all about the money. Last month, the city approved a one point, almost $1.8 billion budget for the next year, which includes 68 more public safety employees and raises for employees. Do you think the city's spending is on track? And if not, please um, suggest a few other changes you'd like to see. Let's start with Commissioner Sheehan. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that we have done a really good job with our city budget. I mean, one of the frustrations I had when I first got elected was that we didn't have monthly reports. We didn't have reports to city council. It wasn't included on our agenda. Commissioner Diamond, way back when, and I worked on a on a platform that would it would basically go over every city department so we could see where we're at on the budget. That was a really important thing to do because now we know where all the department heads are. Um, there's not a now the department has a more a lot more responsible they, they actually turn money back instead of spending every dollar and uh and the one thing that i would like to see of course is um is more money put towards road repairs but we have a new public works director and he's doing a really good job i think it's not it doesn't help to fix this to fix the bricks or or pave the streets or do anything until we get the 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 underlying problem solved when we redid anderson there were baffle boxes that were made of um, of cypress and, and clay pipe. We're going to have to do some major reconstruction. We're already doing a lot of it in the city of Orlando. And, and that's what we need. We need to make sure we're using the money to make the necessary repairs and not letting things rot. If we don't do the necessary maintenance, then we're going to have the problems later. And for a long time, we didn't do the necessary maintenance. Now we're playing catch up, but we're doing the right thing at the city of Orlando. And I think that we are, I think it's a, a balanced budget. It's a good budget and it serves the citizens of Orlando. Thank you, um, Ms. Koch. Thank you, Chris. So as it pertains to the budget that was just rolled out, um, I'm gonna be very clear, 18 years in, in corporate life, I work with budgets all the time. And one of the, the biggest things when it comes to a budget is communicating very clearly um, what that budget is and why and having input. Um, I think it's really important to note that where uh, you know dollars are being spent for infrastructure repair and things like that. I think that's great. We need that. Um, I, I don't think it should be lost that there are dollars being spent on increasing pay raises for commissioners. You know, our commissioners are now up to $76,000 and change with full benefits, uh, where the median income for full-time people um, is still at, you know, just under $40,000. So I think, I think there's some, some up and down to the budget. I don't know that pay increases should have been approved. Um, I also think it's important to note that there's discretionary funding that um, that gets spent. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm i not allowed to spend $100,000 and not communicate to the people that hired me how I'm spending it. So I think the lack of communication on um, how these dollars are being spent it, it is still unclear. And it's important to the residents of District 4 to understand how those dollars are being spent and why they're being spent and maybe ask for some input as well. So, um, so yeah, so thank you for that question. All right, um, Mr. Ross. Back to the mayor's speech yesterday and he talked about community safety. When the city council agrees on community safety, when I did public records request on the number of available OPD officers that we have, it was over 60, even though we have, what, 700, 800 total. When I looked at the or Orange County Fire Department vacancies that we have, so when I look at the budget, I look at it very differently. I say, why are we have, do we have any? Who doesn't want to live in Orlando, Florida? I mean, I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. I, I know they're getting ready to go through fall and they think it's beautiful, but it's so cold up there. And then it's going to be dreary for four or five months. You know, that's not a the greatest place to live. That's why 1,500 people are moving here on a regular basis to Central Florida. And if we know that's the trend, it does not take decades, decades of leadership to know what we need right now in the city of Orlando when it comes to public safety. And that money is available and it should be looked at. We should not be defunding, we should be funding, we should not be transferring uh, responsibility to bar and restaurant owners. We should be protecting the streets so the people that live in Winter Park, the people that live in Kissimmee, the people that live anywhere else that used to love to come down to Church Street Station and everything else, they're being pushed away to the Disney Parks entertainment situation, to Winter Park, Park Avenue, and to uh, Universal. 
That's not the way it should be. Orlando could be an amazing mecca for nighttime entertainment as well. Look at Nashville, look at Greenville, look at some comparable cities. We should not be pushing it away to our competitors. We should be focused on downtown Orlando and public safety allotment dollars should be there, period. I'll jump in for another question if that's all right. Um, I know that the city at this point is the 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 council and the and the leadership has a has a very much of a of a strong mayor set up. And I'm wondering, just just based on what's happened recently, can you name one or two instances where, where you feel like the council should have pushed back on Mayor Dyer? And I will start that with Commissioner Sheehan. Um, there have been a couple of times when I have pushed back on Mayor Dyer, um, you know, and it's been it's been pretty public. Um, but, you know, as a strong mayor system, it can be argued either way. It's the system that we have. Um, I think that you can be a strong commissioner if you work with the different department heads. Now, granted, I did have a real problem with the public works director because he wasn't getting work done in my district and it was frustrating. And that is that's a hard thing when you're a commissioner and you don't have hire or firepower. So that's one of the things that's a challenge for a commissioner in a strong mayor system. But um, I was able to work with the neighborhoods. We were able to kind of shame him and say, look, you are you took our Brick Street funding and, and did only Lake Adair and a couple of streets in Thornton Park. That's not what that Brick Street repair money was for. And he ended up retiring and we got a new public works director. So sometimes you got to be a little creative in the way that you that you work things. But um, I think that Mayor Dyer has done, I think Mayor Dyer has done some things that we never thought would be possible. I never thought we'd get a performing arts center. Mayor Hood tried to do that. I never thought we'd get light rail. Um, Mayor Hood tried to do that, but couldn't. So I think that a strong mayor and Mayor Dyer has done a good job. I enjoyed being on the team, um, you know, and you can't just uh, criticize. You've got to be able to work with the city staff. And I've enjoyed my tenure on the city council. And I've got some major projects coming up, Lake Eola Park, which is a you know major re redevelopment of Lake Eola. Some other major roadway projects are coming up that I want to see through, and I want to get those brick streets refinished. So Summerlin and Delaney, your time is coming. So uh, you know, I think it's I think it's a, I think it's it's our system that we have. I think you know if we want to look at it differently, we certainly can. But uh, I've been able to work well within that system. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ross. Uh, I, I actually want to go back to all of the city council, vote, city council voted unanimously with the mayor when it came to the ordinance in downtown. The solution to the crime in downtown Orlando is there's people, I mean, I talk to OPD officers all the time that are giving me the inside information. People arrive there around one o'clock in the morning. They haven't even been to a bar. So why a bar owner should be penalized for someone who's showing up for some type of activity. Activity. I sound like an old person when I say that. I'm going to be 58 next Tuesday. I have a birthday party I'm doing. I say I'm 36, but I'm going to be 58. And I've lived here long enough on this earth to know that I think it was a bad idea, especially when all of the city council and the mayor voted to keep it going another six months. It's going to go on because the bottom line is whether we have 10 bars or 100 bars, if crime wants to be in your community. I had a friend that was leaving a parking garage the other night, having picked up a friend who had drank too much. The guy behind him got so frustrated with the time it was taking to get out of the parking garage, he was assaulted right there. I, I think that the Mayor Dyer is has done some amazing things. I would also applaud Commissioner Sheehan. The reason an openly gay guy like me can run is because someone like her decided to run in 2000. So I don't I don't talk negatively about that process. What I will tell you, though, is sometimes I feel the council is afraid of the mayor. You cannot bully people if they're if you if I got a store owner over over in a milk district that told me he put up a post and you know somebody was defecating in his backyard and all of a sudden he was getting bullied about his post. That's not the way it works. Our job is to find solutions for the people in District Four. It is not to penalize them. So when it comes to the mayor, nice guy, thanks for everything you've done, but it's time sometimes for folks to realize, move on, do something else. You've done great work. Now it's time to do something else. Thank you, and we'll close it out with Ms. with Ms. Koch. Thank you, Jay. So, a little different perspective here. Um, outside of the work that I do uh, corporately, my husband and I have owned a small business in downtown Orlando for the last eleven years. So, I would push back on the permitting process and the startup process for small businesses in this community. It's incredibly painstakingly hard to open a business. Um, it's it's hard to open a business as it is. 
it's even harder when you have to go through so many different permitting process processes within the city. Um, I don't know if anybody on this call, I don't think they have, has, has opened their own business. Um, it's incredibly expensive. It's time consuming. And the hoops that you have to jump through within, within Orlando are difficult. I can tell you um, we have friends that had to take out personal loans to start their business because the permitting process was taking too long. Um, and I think that that takes away the urge for people to want to develop more but within our district. I think it stops people, you know, new business owners from coming in. I can tell you, so that's incredibly frustrating. I think we need to push back on that process and have some sort of liaison or some sort of task force that helps someone that says, if I want to open a restaurant, this is the process. This is what you need to do. This is what the city needs. These are the requirements, right? And, and to second that, um, because we've been open for 11 years, there's a lack of ongoing support. So we've been in this community and we support this community and we love this community, but there's times where there's such a lack of support that it's hard to want to stay open. It's hard to want to continue to continue being open in this community. Um, so thank you, Jay. I know I'm out of time. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time. Um, but I like to throw out a bit of a philosophical question. Um, Governor DeSantis has done his best to turn the word woke into a four letter word. Um, he rarely name checks Orlando, but, um, but it's kind of clear that, that this city has been in his sights before. Um, do you think the city's policies fall within de that definition? And is that a good or a bad thing? And let's start with Mr. Ross. I have been on the record and open that I'm not incredibly pleased with our governor. Um, some of the decisions, whether it was with the Parental Rights Act, uh, taking it past sixth grade, uh, whether it's uh, regarding the LGBT community in general, I have been outspoken uh, against some of those issues, which those are the ones you're talking about. And not to get into party affiliation, but I am the conservative in this conversation. So when I watch what's happening, I just see it as dividing lines. You know, I'm in my third term appointed by a Democrat on the Orange County Mission and Review Board, Commissioner Myra Uribe. My job on that board is to bring about the best volunteers in Orange County, no matter their party affiliation, sexual orientation, race, or gender. And I do that really well. I work with all sides of the aisle. When I had people in 2020 during COVID reaching out to me, I was talking to a lot of different party affiliation folks to get resolved for those people. So I get the term woke, I think it's being overused, but at the same time, there are times when it does seem a little on the far leaning left and the far leaning conservative right. That's not me, I live in the middle. I'm an openly gay guy. How could I live on one side or the other? I sit, I sit in the middle. So when I look at those conversations, and as I admit to you publicly how I feel about the governor and some of his comments, um, listen, the I-4 corridor is still gonna be a component when it comes to political elections, not just locally, not just statewide, but nationally. And there's gonna be issues that come up as a result of that. Um, and I just wish that, you know, I don't have access to the governor to be able to tell him, I think he needs to simmer down a little bit, but you know, I think a lot of people are already doing that for me. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Sheehan? Yeah, woke was a term that actually was used in the black community to stay woke to make sure that they were, uh, you know, vigilant against racism. And I think that it's actually, you know, been used to, to, to attack anyone who tries to do anything that's progressive. I'm horrified by what happened at Plaza Live when the governor sent in inspectors to raid a drag show. For goodness sake, that was the, I was there at the show. It was a lot of fun and it was the stupidest overreach of state government I've ever seen. I'm a proud progressive. I don't think taking affirming books away from LGBTQ youth is a smart thing. We have, the, you know, LGBTQ youth have the largest suicide rate. That's why I support the Zebra Coalition. And I think that picking on people because they happen to be gay or, or trans is disgusting. It is not in line with American values. And I am tired of this divisive rhetoric 
that does nothing but hurt people, and especially our kids. I went to Lake Como School to see Hamilton with the children, and it was a lot of them is the first time they'd ever been to Dr. Phillips. And they came out and they'd say, oh, you're safe because you have a rainbow pin on. And, and now I see them and they're horrified. What's gonna happen to me? Why are they taking our books away? They went from being proud to being frightened. And that's wrong. Our kids should feel safe in our schools. So I think that I'm proud of wisdom, optimism, kindness, and empathy. That's who I am. That's what I will continue to fight for. And I think that this um, divisive rhetoric is nonsense. And I'm glad to see it's being um, turned down to the national level finally. But we need to stop it because there's still so many things in our state legislature that are happening to, to hurt people. Ms. Koch. Thank you. So, so definitely, I, I, I have lived in, and existed in this community for 18 years, and, and I wouldn't describe us as woke. I would definitely describe us as um, a community that embraces everybody. And having, I have kids in the schools where Governor DeSantis is, um, you know, his, his rulings on, we don't say gay, uh, we're banning books. I see that firsthand. I see I'm in the schools with these kids and, and, and it's devastating them. And it's, there's teachers, principals, uh, you name it, are being affected by this. And I think it's important, um, especially when you're a figure in the LGBTQ plus community to show up for these kids. These kids need support. These teachers need support. And it doesn't stop there. Um, you know, I, I, um, my husband is Jewish. There's been an insane amount of anti-Semitic rhetoric that's been going on in our community as well. We have Nazi flags being hung over I-4. Why aren't we talking about that? Why isn't the leadership in our community talking about the attack on, on the African-American community and the Jewish community? So it doesn't stop there with him, with, with the rhetoric that's going on. And he's enabling these, um, these hate organizations to attack everybody, um, Hispanics, African Americans, Jewish people, so it, it you know it doesn't stop there. So it needs to be brought to attention. People need to be talking about it more, and it needs to be condemned by our leadership in the city for sure. Thank you. Um, the Orlando Sentinel will be making a recommendation in this race. However, we always encourage voters to consider just a starting place. Review each candidate's website. Read Ryan's excellent coverage. And do your own research. Find a candidate who you believe is best qualified to represent your values and hopes for Orlando. Make sure you're ready to vote. You must be a registered voter in District 4 to, rep to um, vote in this particular race. There is a statewide, or city, I'm sorry, a citywide race for mayor as well. Um, the cutoff to register is um, coming up in just a few days. Um, early voting will be taking place October 9th through November 5th at three locations. The closest for most District 4 residents is the uh, elections office on Cayley. Anyone who wants to register to vote by mail must file a new request. They've all expired by October 26th, but you can get those requests in now. And finally, election day is November 7th. And with, uh, with that, I would like to go ahead and ask our, um, ask our um, kids to make their closing statements, um, starting with Ms. Koch. So yeah, so in closing, I would say, you know, after two decades of the same leadership in District 4, you know, we're facing some really serious challenges. Our crime is up, services to the city, um, are down, such as garbage collection, things like that. There's um, definitely um, an opportunity to communicate better with what's going on between the city and the constituents that are voting um, our leadership into District 4. You know, I, as I stated earlier, um, I don't feel like we're a business friendly, a friendly city. I think there's an opportunity to improve that process and bring new businesses and support the existing businesses. Um, but it's just time. It's time for fresh new leadership. Um, you know, I have a background in criminal justice, so there, you know, I understand the need to uh, have the conversation about crime, and we need to be honest about what crime looks like in downtown Orlando, because we can't continue to, to act like it doesn't exist, and it's not growing. And not only is it growing in downtown, it's creeping into our neighborhoods, um, which leads into, you know, 
you know, the need for term limits um, to have fresh new voices. We need to encourage um, people to run, you know, and to feel like they can run and that their voices are being heard. So, you know, um, I'm not a politician. This is not something I ever really thought I would do, to be quite honest with everybody. But after 18 years and watching the decline in, in the city that I love, um, this is important to me. This is not a stepping stone. I have a career. This is just something I'm really passionate about. And I want to make improvements to the city. And um, I love the city. We have roots here. I have family. Uh, we have a business. Uh, the kids are in school here. So it's, it's incredibly important to me that we do the right things to, to make Orlando the city that it can be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Yeah, um, I am proudest of my compassionate leadership after the Pulse Massacre that raised $34 million for the victims of families, protections for LGBTQ community, and public accommodation, housing, and employment. I'm a proponent of the successful Main Street districts who help uh, our business owners through permitting issues and problems, pedestrian and bicycle safety. We've, we're, we've got a beltway going all the way around Orlando that's, that's, that's um, happening. I serve on the East Center Florida Regional Planning Council, work on sustainability initiatives. I provide crime statistics to every single neighborhood monthly. Knowledge is power and our violent crime is down 30% in the city. So I know that there's a, a lot of uh, frustration about it, but we have made, made strides to get violent crime down. We have a new chief, he's excellent. And uh, there are term limits, they're called elections. And if you have a problem with people electing me, maybe it's with the constituency, maybe it's not with me. Uh, you know, I mean, I ask for people's vote. I've been very successful at doing so. And I look forward to continuing to serve the residents of District 4. So listen, yes. I came here in 1993 yes. to, launch, uh, to launch my kids fitness program. And I was an overweight guy that realized that fitness and wellness was not touching kids. And so I went, um, Mayor Glenda Hood at the time had launched, was launching Inner City Games Orlando. And I went to uh, her chief of staff at the time and I said, hey, I'm, I just moved here and I want to do this health and fitness expo. And before I knew it, it was the largest event we had in Inner City Games Orlando, targeting Title I students in Orange, Osceola and Seminole County. And we were getting kids on the right path when it came to health and wellness. And I was still Fat Randy. I was wearing big t-shirts trying to cover it all up. And so you go through time. When I came out in 2002, um, that was a big deal for me. I'd lived my life 36 years as a, as a straight person and I was coming into a whole new environment. Um, but that first relationship I had was a domestic abuse situation. So what did I do in 2014 when I thought there was a problem? I launched Walk a Mile in Her Shoes for Harbor House. Not only did we do 2014, we did 2015 and we raised over $50,000 for that organization as well as a uh, security system. Um, when a friend of mine died of AIDS, I put together an AIDS walk team and we raised over $20,000. You know, and in recent years, you know, my passion has been more uh, driven towards senior issues because obviously I deal with that on a regular basis. Community service and community organizing are about where your passion comes from. Your life story is not an easy one. You're gonna have ups and downs, but my logo on my truck that I drive around in and my logo in this is don't San Francisco or Orlando. We do not need tent cities here. We have a crime problem that is rising because of our homeless situation and we can't just ignore it. We have to do something about it. We cannot keep everything normal. Decades and decades are enough. Okay, now I will sincerely say thank you so much for joining us. Um, and um, we we look forward to and wish you all the best of luck in um, in the coming election. Thank you.